Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, uh, Ms. Dingle, for five minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Administrator Reagan, thank you for being here to testify. We all appreciate your continued leadership at EPA. I think I wish I worked a little less with you some <laughs> days. Uh, and I want to commend, um, as Jen Schakowsky did, your Regional 5 Administrator. Uh, I think our chairman's had more of your attention lately, but we've had too many chemical skulls, and I've got a lot of other issues I'm worried about. Let me begin. As you know, I'm a car girl. The future of the automotive industry and its workforce is an intense priority for me, which you know. We have to accelerate domestic electric vehicle development. We're competing in a global marketplace. If we don't do it, it's happening in China now. And we've got to deploy them to meet our climate goals and compete with China. But in doing so, we cannot leave behind the working men and women who've built their lives and careers in the auto industry. Administrator Reagan, as we make the transition to clean vehicles, there's a real fear that the workforce needed to help us make that transition is going to be left behind. As it relates to the EPA's overall work and the most recent proposed multi-pollutant emission standards rule for model years 20. 27 through 34, how is EPA working to address these long-term workforce concerns? Well, well, thank you for the question, and thank you for being such a champion on these issues. As we've been developing uh, these rules, we've stayed in contact with our labor unions. Um, we've stayed in contact with anyone that's focused on sort of job creation, education, and the like, as we design and propose this rule. Um, thanks to your leadership and the connectivity, we've also been able to at least establish early conversations with new leadership at the UAW. <clears throat> so I have to say that it's a priority. It's a priority not just for me, it's a priority for the president, as you well know. And as we continue to move forward with this proposal, I can assure you that the labor component, uh, the supply chain component, uh, the infrastructure component, all of these components are at the top of mind for how this rule could be executed. Thank you. It must continue to be there. Water affordability continues to be a major issue for me and for all of us as well. It's a basic human right. In 2020 and 21, Congress authorized and appropriated $1.1 billion to HHS to create the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program as a temporary program to provide water and wastewater bill assistance to low income households burdened by the economic consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. I'm a strong supporter of this program, but it's gonna expire at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. Families are struggling, and it's clear there needs to be a longer-term solution. The bipartisan infrastructure law authorized the EPA to conduct a study for establishing a similar pro pilot program to the LIH at WEP program to help families who are struggling to pay their water bills. Can you provide this committee with an update on that study, and when can Congress expect to receive that report? We'll, we'll give you a completion date on that soon. Um, I can tell you that we've been working hand in glove with HHS on this affordability assessment and we're scoping this study out. Uh, I think it's gonna be on time and on budget, but I'll have to get you that, that date at a later time. I suspect you're gonna need additional resources, but I've got a PFAS question before I run out of time. Forever chemicals are everywhere in our modern society and are harmful to human health and environment. The EPA has proposed to designate the two most toxic forever chemicals as hazardous substances under CERCLA, for which I thank you because I've asked every EPA administrator uh, when we're going to do that. Um, but after EPA proposed to designate the PFO and PFOS as hazardous substances, the National Association of Water Companies and others have written to Congress to request protection from liability for cleaning up PFAS contamination. My office has also heard from a number of water utilities from the state of Michigan with these concerns. Administrator Riggin, how does EPA plan to address the concerns of water and wastewater utilities and other entities that have these liability concerns and claims that exemptions are required since they're not the original source of the PFAS pollution? Well, and that's very much at the top of my mind. And I think EPA was only successful because of the partnership with DOD and USDA. I've worked with both secretaries hand in hand. The, the, the bottom line is we have enforcement discretion. We believe that CERCLA gives us that enforcement discretion. I want to be clear that the water utilities and our farmers and agriculture are not the target, but the target is those who are putting this pollution into our air and our water. So how are we going to make polluters pay? 
Uh, number one, we're asking for resources to beef up our enforcement. Number two, we're already taking action against many of these PFAS polluters. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, many of these discharges are illegal and have an adverse impact on public health, and we're going to hold these polluters accountable. We can do that with our enforcement arm because we have the authority already to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. General Lady yields back.